These 10 League of Legends personalities did irreversible damage to their brand in various ways and degrees, and we're going to start right away with Vagar V2. Vagar V2 is perhaps one of the best coaches in the League of Legends sphere, at least in Europe. He has mostly worked with esports organizations and making a career in the League of Legends esports scene. On a fateful day in April of 2020, Vagar V2 would be fired from Fnatic over inappropriate comments towards minors. Originally, P-Star brought up that Vagar V2 used to DDoS people and this tweet became somewhat viral. Some of them were surprised that he was working with Fnatic at the time. Thereafter, a female named Destinier was surprised of that fact and shared old screenshot of when Vagar V2 was 17, sexually harassing her and her 7 year old sister at the time. Fnatic would, after a few hours, cut ties with Vagar V2 immediately. Vagar would eventually respond in a tweet longer to the drama where he stated that in 2017 2018 I was 16 to 17 years old and involved with a disgusting group of people. I said really, really disgusting things, but I still cannot believe what I said. At the end of 2018, I started to grow up and realize how bad everything. Thing I've done in the past was and I wanted to leave it all behind me. I removed myself from the people that influenced me. I want to apologize to Destiny Air for what I have said about her sister. I look back on these actions with shame and disbelief. A lot of people would actually take Vagar's side, respecting the changes he made and vouching for his good personality. I mean, after all, this was way back in the past and we know just how weird and toxic the league community can be. Destiny Air would eventually also make a tweet longer on the same day of the drama where she said, it was not my intention to share the screenshots for Cloud. They are all deleted now. I do not intend to risk Vagar's character. Career, I did not know he had a career. I had him blocked for two years and still do. Two years gives time to learn and grow. He's not a p file to my knowledge. But she also stated that I do not forgive the comments he once made. It seems nowadays that they are on good terms, at least in the public eye. Vagar V2 would eventually come back from this drama as he would be later be signed for Cloud9, helping them a lot during the course of their splits to come. His business would also thrive, where he has coached countless amount of people. Although Vagar V2 recovered from the drama, Scripter 1v9 is still plagued by his. Scripter 1v9, a challenger player from Sweden, has had a very controversial growth period for his content creator career. Scripter 1v9 is just another average league player coming out of a toxic community. While being in a toxic community, he did some bad things, and well, that would be shared on Twitter a lot. At first, it would be hardcore racism, which he would get memed on about, and also making death threats indiscriminate. But at some point, people would reveal that he made remarks towards minors in a supposed sexual manner. Scripter 1v9 is a guy who tends to like and comment on a lot of girls, and some of them, allegedly most of them, would be underage. This would be seen as very suspicious and very weird behavior from Scripter 1v9. The community would also take these screenshots as self-reporting, but most likely these were made with sarcasm in mind as a response to the pedo allegations against him. While there has been no proof of Scripter 1v9's pedophilia, his image seems to be tarnished by just looking at the Twitter search, or the fact that his replies on Twitter are only for mutuals. The community would also criticize the fact that he goes on massive win streak accounts, which seems impossible to do, but the fact of the matter is that these accounts have hardstock MMR in iron, so he would essentially play against real really bad players for a massive amount of games, garnering that sweet win rate. While not many find this entertaining after knowing the fact, others seem to be amazed and enjoy such content where he still rolls games on his champions while vibing to music. While Scripter tries to remain in his supposed bubble, Nis would take things head on. This quote unquote challenger coach has made a lot of coaching videos for free by publishing it on YouTube and prides himself on that fact. He would consistently brand himself as a challenger player while also being challenger in multiple roles. This part of marketing would fuel his growth and also his financial gain. At some point, the demand for his coaching would be so high he he raised his prices up to $300. It was until at this point Nis would get a lot of attention from the league community. Shove first. Shove first. No, 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 we're not just going. We're not going blind. You're not going blind. Yeah, I don't know why I'm here if you're not listening. But, I mean, but, but why am I why am I here though? Why am I here? The play's dead. The points give you more gold! They give you more gold than rotating! You get more XP! Why the fuck am I here? I can be hanging out with my wife right now! Why am I here? His coaching would eventually get criticized, and the main proponent of this would be Tarsaint. Tarsaint would especially look at his jungle vods talking about how bad Nice is mechanically and that he lacks critical gameplay knowledge. Nice would call him being obsessed. Nice's ego would eventually cause him to copyright strike Tarsaint. While this copyright strike was invalid due to Tarsaint using transformative content, it would cause a public backlash towards Nice in the league community, further ruining his image. Yasuke would eventually drop a thread on Nice, which exposes him of not being challenger 
You see, one of the primary advertisements Nis did as a content creator would be his advertisement of being challenger, such as in Season 6, Season 7, and Season 9. If you type League of Legends coaching, you'll see Nis. This is where his audience comes from. He would also claim to being challenger on all roles. There was no evidence for this, and Yasuko actually proved otherwise by showing Nis never reached challenger in NA. Nis would have a lot of inconsistencies about his challenger claims though. For example, Nis would state that he is a Season 7 challenger player, but also stating that he didn't reach challenger in NA, but in Latin America South server, that is significantly easier to play on than NA. He also has a challenger backpack that comes from this Latin America South server endeavor. Regardless, this is what Yasuke first wrote in his thread about Nis not being challenger. Nis would eventually ego him and respond with a screenshot of him being challenger on his NA account. Although Nis has a degree in graphic design from Volsail University, this screenshot would be proven to be fake with italicized font, wrong league client font, and as well as the text not being centered to the challenger emblem. Digital forensics would also corroborate that this screenshot was faked. Previously, Nis also made specific claims to when he was challenger, which could be disproven with the website League of Records, which showed that his account never ever reached challenger at all. The backlash was even more intense, and his socials would be hit hard with less viewerships and subscribers departing. He even admitted to not being challenger in a podcast as well. Comfort myself with my challenger backpack as a non-challenger peak player. I need to comfort myself. Regardless, Nis's fraud would not be as bad as what Steven Jax would do. Steven Jax is perhaps one of the most unhinged persons on this list. While being a high elo top laner in the NA solo queue ladder, he was also known for being extremely racist, abusing his fellow teammates and sending them death threats. Riot Games would suspend his account for hateful conduct such as racism, sexism, homophobia, or other untargeted harassment. These screenshots are not YouTube friendly, but at some point in 2019, he would get exposed for extreme sexual misconduct with minors as well. The infamous Immigrant album shows Steven Jax allegedly sending pictures of his village to someone as young as 16 years old. He would say stuff like, she made some mistakes, but after forcing her to hurt herself, we're good now. She paid for what she did, no regret at all. He goes on about threatening to damage his own body and her body if someone continues to flame him. At some point on Snapchat, Stevens would fantasize about this girl being a little sister to him as young as 14 years old while giving her grapes, aka YouTube language. He would also carve out a name on his hand, obviously damaging his hand. I'm not sure what name this is, but I imagine this is one of the girls he's talking with. There is also screenshots of a 14 year old talking about Stevens Jax. I went into the voice call. He started telling me about how he's the only person who likes me, and that he's supposed to hurt me. The person later admits that Steven sent her a picture of his Ville Vonka and wants to e-date her. There's also this vile audio clip of Steven's talking about what's on his computer, also known as exposing child images. Okay, what happened? Okay, it's actually crazy. <clears throat> I was like, uh, I was like really high off edible. And then I looked at my, I looked at my computer and I was like, holy f I have some f up shit in my computer. And I was really high, like I took way too much. I was like having some kind of like panic attack because I was thinking about all the f like other issues that I have on my computer. And if like police comes where I, cause I have like a bad like pass in real life. So I, I was scared, you know, in my head. Like, police, if they come, they have, like, all reasons to look in my room, you know, because I have a really bad pass uh, in real life with, like, stuff, so. While his image was practically ruined, he would continue with his streaming career, still being a micro-celebrity to this day, working on his YouTube and streaming consistently. And the Jax Predator meme is probably mostly attributed to him, but there is also another person attributing to the Jax Predator meme, namely Hashinshin. Hashinshin, the super top laner and also inventor of the Hashinshin teleport, is perhaps the most memed about person in League of Legends. He is also a very controversial person to talk about, as his misconduct allegations span over several years. In 2020, Hashinshin would be permanently banned from Twitch after being accused of grooming minors. He would deny these allegations and call them out to be fake while starting a big dispute with Boy Boy. There is so much evidence to go through of Hashinshin, but the main counter argument that Hashinshin provides is that the evidence is fake, that it is doctored evidence made to attack him. While his arguments make sense some of the time and actually have validity when it comes to his toxic abusive ex that admitted herself that she was faking evidence, it doesn't provide any defense for the evidence against him for grooming other minors. He even posted a 37 page document about denying all of the allegations against him. This document originally was ousting his girlfriend at the time for doctoring evidence and colluding with several girls in an attempt to cancel Hashinshin. A day later, video calls and multiple screenshots was released which provided evidence for Hashinshin knowing the age 
age of Wu he talked with, ranging from 15 to 17 years old. Why does it make you sad? You're a cute girl, you're charming, you just try so hard not to be. And he also actually admitted to sending inappropriate comments to underage girls. Hashinshin sent pictures and videos of his video via Snapchat where the infamous Hashinshin carpet video quote unquote meme comes from. Voiboy Boy was the leading person in this crusade, as Hashinshin calls it. Voiboy Boy was providing the evidence and going through the allegations one by one, as Hashinshin was gaslighting his audience. Now, Hashinshin got very stressed from this situation, and at one point he was admitted to the hospital for an attempt at death in game, but in real life attempt. Eventually, Hashinshin would get banned on Twitch as a result of these allegations permanent. The FBI would also get involved in this situation with Hashinshin by investigating him. They showed up at his house, went through all of his stuff, and later would clear him as he was not arrested or charged with anything. There is way too much to talk about Hashinshin, but nevertheless his image would be destroyed and his livelihood partially ruined. Although he moved on to websites like YouTube and Kick, he lost his Twitch channel still to this day. However, while Hashinshin still managed to get by in the league space, the same might not go for Cookie Lol. Imagine you are on a vacation in Spain, chilling out with your girlfriend, and your streaming career is going well. You have grown to 2000 average live viewers from almost nothing, providing a lot of educational information on the ADC role, and actively advertising your Patreon to gain more revenue, furthering your goals of financial freedom to buy luxury cars, houses, etc. But then, a 90 page long document is released providing evidence for sexual misconduct against minors, committing financial fraud, evidence of you admitting to sexual assault, creepy behavior towards women, toxic behavior towards your community, and delayed payments to your contracted workers. This is exactly what happened to Cookie Lol. Cookie's document is just way too long to go through in a short video like this, but he made a lot of inappropriate remarks to minors and many of these remarks are memed upon such as, I would set flash ult your insert female organ here. He would also allegedly talk to females at the age of 13. Not only does he have misconduct going in for him, but he also created group chats with trusted community members to commit financial fraud with companies that were sponsoring him. Cookie wanted them to create accounts to reach limits that would increase monetary gain for him. This document had been viewed to over 2.6 million people and Cookie would promptly but hastily make an apology through tweet longer where he apologized for each thing listed in the 90 long document but for some reason goes into excruciating details about his sexual assault incident when he was younger. People were not happy with the apology and were weirded out with the details he provided which prompted Cookie to make another tweet where he says I am ashamed of myself and I'm deeply sorry to all those that have been affected by my behavior over the last years. I panicked and wrote a statement that probably felt insincere and it wasn't my intention and Cookie would later go on stream on the 15th of April to talk about everything live. It couldn't get worse, right? Sadly, it did, as once Cookie's stream went live, it was immediately clear that this was a pre-recorded video. People I harassed, I was just creepy, an asshole. What the f is this? This came out like a dark web hurt, video, bro. Is this like a trailer? Is that like the beginning of it? I'm sorry. Wait, wait, here we go. Getting here. kicked into a well. This is pre-recorded. Cookie's alleged video live stream would go on for seven minutes only, where many people noted that his apologies were very insincere and fake crying. Not only that, Cookie's stream would be monetized as he gained over 400 Twitch subs as people were gifting subs so that they could criticize him in the chat. I swear on my life that I will never, yeah. ever, until the day I don't exist anymore, I will never Shut talk up. to anyone on rage, never sexually like that, never. Forget that, bro, you just sorry. weak. Ever since 2020, I've never had a sexual connection to anyone below the age of 18, and it's been fully consensual on both sides. What about 2022? <laughs> Cookie has faced extreme backlash from being exposed, such as people saying that they have doxxed him and sending his parents a USB file of what he has done or just generally memeing his comments. But nevertheless, Cookie has said he will take some time off from social media. However, a day after his apology Twitch stream, he would come with an update on his Patreon stating that I have sins to atone for, no more apologizing will help. I will instead make sure that I do good deeds moving forwards. I understand everyone that hates me right now, but for those that are just here to learn and to become better, I will do my best to provide the best education 
educational content I can bring. Moving forwards, I will start uploading 2 to 3 daily educational videos and you guys can vote for their rank and champions in the upcoming polls. I'm taking a break from social media but I'll come back to the Patreon Discord first. Not many people were happy with this as this sparked more outrage on Twitter. What remains of Cookie Lul's career is to be seen. While Cookie Lul's 90 page document is damning, his behavior was not as horrifying as Super Metroid. Four years ago, Super Metroid's career was going to take a sudden downfall. Twitter user Juniper Berry would expose Super Metroid. She tweeted that Super Metroid is targeting underage girls and messaging them extremely disturbing stuff, trying to persuade them to send him pictures, sending the girls pictures, and telling them he loves them and what he wants to do with them. Juni laid various proof of Super Metroid's sexual misconduct towards minors by providing screenshots of her own conversation with him and other minors that were her friends. Even someone as young as 15. In these obscene screenshots, his behavior is extremely inappropriate when talking to these girls. Texting sexually almost every single time and out of the blue brings up sexual topics. He even sends these underage girls lolly hentai saying, I wish it was us. He also clearly stated to these girls that he was very attracted to you and I love you. Super Metroid also admitted to dating an underage girl as well, saying he lied about her age when he found out his ex was 15 years old, but she was 17 at the time when they got together when he was 22. Super Metroid also claimed that she tried to claim I was stalking her and I was called by the police and I told I wasn't allowed to contact her anymore or they would try to go after me because obviously we did stuff while we were together. Viewing his screenshots is pretty rough as he even tells this 16 year old that he likes incest, lolly and bestiality. This 16 year old girl alleges or at least strongly implies that Super Metroid sent her a picture of his villa by providing a screenshot to her friend where Super Metroid says no comment on me being really big, okay, and discusses this further in detail with her friends. Super Metroid's conduct would eventually be exposed as you know and he would go off social media in the aftermath that was to come. After some time, he returned to Twitter to say that he was very lonely, had mental health issues and that after being exposed, he was sent death threats by random people and other content creators isn't the way to go. And he has taken steps in getting better such as therapy. Super Metroid would eventually delete his social media after the backlash was too much, rebranding himself as Sativert. He uploaded regularly and gained a new community but nevertheless has taken an indefinite break. While Sativert's misconduct was extreme, it was not as malicious as what XJ9 would do. In season 2 and 3, League of Legends would have a lot of promising talent and one of them would be XJ9. He stayed rank 1 for multiple months in a row while playing with a very aggressive carry style jungling during the time. However, even one of the best players in NA League at the time can become a community outcast. XJ9 or Joseph Zelensky is mostly known for publicizing revenge porn of his girlfriend back in 2013 because she simply played certain champions in League of Legends. You see, XJ9 really hates Lee Sin and his girlfriend played Lee Sin in a game with him. She overreacted to the point of me doing that and now it's like, okay, we both did something wrong, let's make up. Okay, her wrong was playing Lee Sin. And that hurt me so bad. So he proceeded to do what any rational human being would do in this situation, posting her nudes on Facebook. There's a whole segment of videos in 9 parts by the debate streamer Destiny where he talks with X9J about him having Asperger's. So Asperger's is, I think it's a form of autism. Um, I could be wrong on that though, but I think it's a form of autism. But basically what it is, is it means you have an inability to empathize with other people. About whether he feels remorse and about how he feels about society. I feel as if society is so effed up that they don't even realize what good is anymore. It's like everyone is like chasing Batman, even though he's doing the right thing. And then they send everything against me because they know I can take it. I'll be honest, I get really depressed at the point of like some suicidal thoughts and shit. And it's just like, mm, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you okay, dude? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, no, can I be the girl? X9J would eventually even do push ups in front of a camera for Destiny, but later on, Destiny was fed up and would threaten to dox him by posting his phone number in Destiny's livestream chat if X9J didn't delete his ex's news online. I think if you don't, I'm gonna post your phone number in chat. Are you ready? <laughs> Can you not do that? <laughs> okay, Destiny? Destiny? <laughs> Mr. Destiny. <laughs> Is the first Destiny. number of the phone number six? Destiny, please stop. Is it 6-3? Destiny, okay, Destiny, I'll take it down. It needs to be down pretty soon. Okay, 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 Destiny! Is it 6-3-1? Okay, 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 it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. 
In an interview with League 5, XNJ admitted to hacking his ex-girlfriend's League account and he purposely lost 5 games in a row to spite her. X9J stated that what I did wasn't right. I was drunk with depression and stress. I acted rash. That's not who I am. I begged the community to give me one last chance. In the same year, XNJ would be implicated in a post by Riot Games. Riot Games stated that he has made very explicit death threats against another user, stolen other players' accounts after getting login information, and he also hijacked another account and getting that account banned by spamming adult images and other file threads to get it banned. Riot Games would say that X9J's acts within League of Legends is seen as intentional and malicious, and he has no place within our community and thereby confirming an indefinite suspension. I'm pretty sure that who Riot mentions here is his girlfriend, as X9J would have access to her logins after boosting her to die and eventually he would also intentionally derank the account to get her banned after the fallout with her. In another post, Riot Games would further state that We have seen you hack numerous players, publicly harass community members involved in account sharing on numerous occasions, which resulted in his accounts having a permanent suspension. This was also among one of the first ID bans in League of Legends. Mr. Solensky would eventually be announced as a coach for the Super Hot crew in July of 2014, coaching alongside LS. But his time in the team was very brief. Later in 2015, he was actually unbanned from League of Legends after completing a trial period with Riot to allow him back in. However, they almost immediately reversed this decision as the writer who granted him the trial period acted in error and his permanent ban would stay. This was very controversial in the community as people were talking about ecosystems for rehabilitating toxic players. X9J would have been forgotten for a long time by the community. X9J committed to playing a league and he wanted to redeem himself for his actions in the early 2010s. Not much happened. X9J would resort to some elo boosting, but it was not until October in 2021 that he confirmed that he was unbanned 8 years after the fact. To this day, X9J maintains a small following on his socials but nevertheless a dark but talented gem forgotten in League history. While X9J's malicious actions in the past were in the end redeemable, at least to Riot, Bradley Miller's actions would be unforgivable. Meet King Vex, also known as Bradley Miller, a talented esports player who has been a part of various esports teams since 2016. His skills brought him further up the NA esports industry ladder, and in 2022 he even reached Challenger, a significant achievement that he proudly shared on his Twitter. But life can take unexpected turns. One day, a cyber tip from Kick was sent to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which reported a video that depicted the sexual abuse of prepossessant child. The video was uploaded on Kink and sent privately from one user to another. An IP trace and an email address checkup of the account led it to be associated with Bradley Edward Miller, a 24-year-old Northport man. The authorities arrested him and he was charged with traveling to meet a child for an unlawful sexual act, electronic solicitation of a child, second-degree rape, and second-degree sodomy. Shockingly, this was not his first offense. He had a second-degree rape case in 2020, which actually revoked his bond of $150,000. The details of what happened next are unclear, but in July of that same year, Mr. Miller made the most wanted list. Let's check in now with the Tuscaloosa County Sheriff's Office, here's this week's Most Wanted. I'm Deputy Sheriff Jessica McDaniel with the Tuscaloosa County Sheriff's Office and we need your help locating some of Tuscaloosa County's Most Wanted. Bradley Edward Miller, white male, 24 years of age, 5'8", 125 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, last known to be living in the area of Turtle Bay Circle, Northport, Alabama, wanted for second degree and traveling to meet a minor for unlawful sex act. Of the Tuscaloosa County Sheriff's Office, charged with second degree rape and traveling to meet a minor for unlawful sexual activity. Bradley's life changed drastically. He went from being an upcoming esports player with a somewhat promising future to an outright disgusting criminal. The consequences of his actions will haunt him forever, but as worse as Mr. Miller was, only one person in the league community can perhaps rival his crimes. It's being called the largest hacking fraud case in history. Prosecutors indicted Russian hackers today for stealing at least 160 million credit card numbers from institutions ranging from JCPenney to the NASDAQ, resulting in losses of hundreds of millions of dollars. This type of crime is really uh, the cutting edge of financial fraud. They targeted some of the largest companies in the world, stealing millions of credit and debit card numbers and causing hundreds of millions of dollars in losses to their victims. The five alleged Russian hackers using sophisticated software and breaking into major institutions like NASDAQ, Dow Jones, and JetBlue Airlines. 17 companies compromised, three alone left with at least $300 million in damages. 
Muska 5 is considered one of the most successful teams in League of Legends history, known for their aggressive and innovative playstyle. They were particularly famous of their use of counter jungling strategies and their dominance in the European League of Legends scene during their prime. Probably one of the funnest clips is where Muska 5 has to apologize after being toxic in a league match which was shown on screen, and this video kinda looks like a certain type of videos coming out of the Middle East. We wanted to, we just want to apologize uh, for our behavior. Uh, we want to apologize uh, to the team Monosports, to the English community, to the Russian community. Our behavior was really awful. I mean, this is a question about the sportsmanship. Even if you are not in mood, even if you are nervous, even if you are like, uh, don't I mean, if you can't even get calm, you shouldn't uh, fall uh, to this level. You should uh, show the best performance, the best sportsmanship, no matter of the situation. Uh, uh, we are working on this situation, we are discussing it, uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, we won't uh, repeat this situation. It will, it will never happen again. Yeah, it will never happen again. But anyways, meet Moscow 5's owner, Dmitry Silmanets, or Dims. I'm the leader of Moscow 5, uh, I ask you to apologize, this will never happen again. On a warm summer day in July of 2012, Dimitri was sightseeing in Amsterdam until he suddenly got arrested by Dutch police. Apparently, Dimitri was arrested due to his involvement in one of the biggest ever US hacking cases. Dimitri was one of four Russians and one Ukrainian connected to a scheme that stole about 160 million credit and debit cards from 17 various companies, which caused losses of more than $300 million. It was even called one of the largest hacking and data breach schemes ever prosecuted in the United States at the time. Time. The group penetrated the computer network of several of the corporate companies targeted and stole usernames and passwords, other means of identification, credit and debit card numbers, and more of the cardholders. They did this by doing an SQL injection attack which gave them access to the corporation's network and thereby placed malware to create a backdoor to maintain access to the network. Sadly for Dimitri, he would be extradited three months later to the United States. Dimitri's role in this was serving as a broker for the stolen financial information, so he was basically selling it on. He would charge you $10 for an American card or $50 for an European one. And hey, if you were a repeat buyer, you would be getting a sweet discount. It's important to notice that Moscow 5 was in its prime while their owner Dimitri was arrested, having won various high prestige tournaments, ending top 5 at every event except for one, for two and a half years straight. Now, they also started what is known as counter jungling today, and as well as roaming support, which is way before anyone else. And these concepts are used today very much in League. Also, they had very fun and uncommon builds and picks, and they managed to perform against the best teams in the world. Moscow 5 is also one of the few Western teams that were actually competitive with Korean teams. Moscow 5 has an incredible amount of rich history that is interesting to explore. It's an undeniable fact that Moscow 5 shaped the way how League of Legends is played for the years that was to come. But Moscow 5 struggled heavily due to the arrest of their leader. They admitted on their website that it was a heavy burden to deal with the internal financial crisis after the leader was arrested. Although they managed to secure sponsorship deals with MSI and BenQ the following month, when Dimitri was arrested, it was not enough though, as they needed to secure more sponsors but failed in the end having to let go of multiple teams, and at last their League of Legends team had to be left as well. They also stated that with the loss of the League of Legends roster, the project is becoming inactive, but there is a possibility that in the near future Moscow 5 will come back. After Dimitri served his prison sentence of just more than 4 years, he returned back to life. These days Dimitri has reformed as he is now an intelligence expert at a cybersecurity company. He stated that he got into criminal hacking because during this time in Russia, Russia, there was no law for cyber and at some point I believed I wasn't committing any crimes, it felt easy. Even so, Dimitri Silmanets is definitely the number one ranking in League of Legends personalities who ruined their image. Let me know if you agree with this list.